Yeah, go for it. Okay, so look, good afternoon and welcome to our Lunchbox series. Um, my name's Stuart Moore, I'm, I'm the CEO and founder of EarthCheck and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. And now we've got a different forum, we've got both staff and partners and we've also got clients, so it's a welcome to you all. And we're also going to have questions uh, that come up during the forum and, and Andre is going to handle those at the end of our presentation. So just to give you some context, uh, we hold Inner Circle every month at EarthCheck and the reason we do that is to give our clients uh, and our staff and our partners an update on our own our products and services and also to track current trends in market. And that could be sustainability trends or environmental trends. This year is a very special year for EarthCheck because we celebrate 30 years of being in the sustainability business which is a perfect segue for why this is such a, a special presentation because it gives us a chance to celebrate the role played by our auditors in our benchmarking and certification program. So if we step back and just think about that, our auditors are our eyes and ears in market and they in fact are in a better position to understand the operational environment faced by our clients than we are and through that are in a wonderful position to be able to help to work with us to actually uh, provide efficiency gains and also reduce the environmental footprint. So they play a really important role. And as a part of our presentation today, we have a lead auditor who's been working with EarthCheck since 2008, so that's nine years, <laughs> has been a key partner of the company. And you know, I can tell you that um, I read uh, Kathy's CV last night, and I've also passed with her how I'm allowed to introduce this. <laughs> so I, I can tell you that this lady uh, is a legend in the resource uh, and project management sector, particularly with regard to resource management and certification and environmental management covering a 20 year period. You could almost say she was a veteran. I had to throw that in, Kathy. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, Kathy started life doing a Bachelor of Science at Queensland University and then went on to do 15, I counted these, 15 other courses, certificates and degrees covering a multiple of sectors which I am not going to walk you through today other than to let you know that you're in very capable hands with a very qualified practitioner. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Cathy Colton to come up and give you a presentation on the role of auditors which is going to take us on a variety of journeys and then we're going to come back to the table and answer questions. So please welcome uh, Cathy to the podium. Thank you. Okay, well, um, good afternoon everybody, or wherever you are, hello. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, as Stuart's pointed out, I've had a very long history with EarthCheck and it's been a really wonderful experience for me. I really enjoy being an auditor. Now that is, um, for some people who think auditors are, you know, second only to the devil, um, <laughs> I can imagine that, you know, people are going, oh my God, this woman's crazy. But I actually really enjoy auditing and I really enjoy working in the area of natural resource management and sustainability. Because for me, it's a wonderful piece of subject matter. I really enjoy energy, water, waste. I'm very happy delving into people's waste bins, you know, so <laughs> clearly I'm a very odd person. <laughs> but I also find that um, when you say the word auditor, a whole bunch of different pictures comes up in people's minds, and usually they're not terribly pleasant. Uh, so I want to say at the outset, first of all, these are my observations as, as an auditor. Not every auditor is like me. We are all different. We all come in different shapes and sizes. We all have different uh, experiences. And perhaps we all have different uh, ways of doing things. But one of the things I want to say from the outset is I do not believe being an auditor is being a policeman, which I think sometimes auditors come, come, come across as being policemen. Well, that's not my job as far as I see it. My job is to go into an organisation to look at whether they are complying with a particular standard that they want to be certified against. That's my job. Now, whether they do or they don't, or whether they're partially there or not there, um, my job then is to provide information to them, if I can. Um, I'm not a consultant, and I don't take on that role, but I can direct them 
to areas where they might um, find information. And I can also assist them, if I can, uh, in, in basically providing information about where they have not adhered to the standard. But I don't ever see myself as a policeman. I also don't pass judgment. I think anybody who takes on a role, uh, who decides as an organisation that they're going to go forward to certification, it should be admired. From my perspective, it's a, it's a, a commitment of an organisation to do something out of the ordinary. Nobody's forcing them into it. They want to do it because they want to improve. And I, I come from that perspective. So, having burbled on for quite a bit of time, I'll go into my experience. I think one of the things I really like about EarthCheck too is that um, I do not, I'm not an employee of EarthCheck. I'm a completely independent operator, but I am asked by EarthCheck to certify. So it's a third party certification. And pretty much my experience has been roughly outlined by Stuart. <laughs> and pretty much I have just had a very long career doing a number of different things. I actually started um, life in my career as a teacher. I soon discovered that I did not fit well into the school system. So <laughs> I decided that it was time for me to bail out. So I did my probationary year, one other term, and then ran screaming from the school system. Um, but uh, then I decided, well, I better go and do something else. Uh, but actually, educational, my training as a teacher has really been useful to me because I've done actually a lot of training work in the corporate sector and also for EarthCheck. And I've really enjoyed that. I don't mind being a trainer, I just don't want to work in the school system. I found children quite um, interesting. Uh, <laughs> don't we all? I prefer adults. If I'm going to teach anybody, I think I prefer. I also get on, uh, I get on well with children, but I also uh, find that um, trying to get people to sit still for long periods of time when they're very young is ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> clearly, they're not designed for it, and why would you, anybody want to do it? But anyway, that's my view about teaching. However, so I then went forward and uh, did a degree in natural um, zoology, actually, and then I did postgrad year in fisheries technology. I actually spent some time at Maritime College in Tasmania. So I started life in fisheries. I worked in the environment department. I worked in... Thank you. I worked in the environment department. I also worked in for the quarantine service, in ballast water management. Um, oh yeah, so many. I've had many sort of different roles. And funnily enough, I've ended. Um, I became a consultant uh, in 2000. Then I started my own company in 2004, and that's pretty much where I've been ever since. But very recently, I've just taken on some more work with the federal government in Canberra in the uh, part of the environment. Uh, so I'm, I have a very varied career in, in natural resource management. Now, how did I come, become an Earth auditor for EarthCheck? Well, I had already done my ISO 14001 certification. I then was approached by EarthCheck. I'd already been working for them as a trainer and so forth uh, in 2008 to ask if I'd be interested in auditing. And I said, sure, I'd love to. And, um, and that started me on this fantastic journey. I have enjoyed myself so much. And a lot of it combines my love of travel and uh, my interest in the tourism industry, but also my background in natural resource management. And then, and also teaching has come into it because I've actually trained auditors. And one of the, the nicest things I've ever done is really, um, I've really enjoyed upskilling auditors in different countries. So my job has been really to train auditors and then get them to work in their own country in language which I think is absolutely um, right and proper, and it should be done that way, that we have in-country auditors working in language. And I've enjoyed it. So I've um, done some great um, auditing gigs in um, places like Mexico. I had a fantastic um, auditing experience in Iceland. Uh, I did a, ran a program in London, a training course in London, did some audits there, did some audits in Paris, uh, and ran a training course there. I did a training course in Hong Kong and um, of course I do USA and Canadian audits too and of course I do audits here in Australia. So I've been incredibly lucky and I've enjoyed every minute of it. So that's me. So today I'm going to talk to you about what my approach is to an audit. And I'm hopeful that for, for some of you uh, who may never see me as an auditor, it will just give you um, a bit of a background as to what I'm thinking about 
when I start off in an audit process. And also the kind of things I'm looking for, and I thought it might be helpful if I just spoke a little bit about what do I see as the common problems when we go forward into an audit and what, and it might be helpful to some of the people listening. So the, I'm breaking it up into things like the pre-audit. So what do I do before I ever get to a site? What am I thinking about when I'm an, on audit day? Using iAuditor, which I think is a great piece of software that Earthcheck use now, and the post audit. So what am I thinking about and how do I write a report? So when I actually get a job, I'm asked by Earthcheck to, to do an audit, I'm sent papers. Uh, so the papers are things I'm sent are things like the self-assessment checklist. Now I'm going to talk quite a bit about that today because to me that is an absolutely pivotal document in how the kind of information I get before I go on site. So I think people can make a lot more use of that and really do a good job in providing a background and telling me lots more about their business because I'm really interested to know. So my, I check the papers obviously, I do my first read through and I go online and I also go online and look at whether the property or the organisation has a website of some kind. Because I wanted to just get a bit of background and um, you know, sometimes uh, it's the first time I've ever heard of this organisation so I need to just get a feel for what's going on. Now, the self assessment checklist, this is such an important document and often when I get it, I do a quick sort of scan through it, but one of the issues I've got is people, when you ask them to say yes or no, they do say yes or no, but then they don't tell you anything else. It's like, I just, yes or no. I need detail. I need lots of, int I want to know more than just yes or no. Because to me, um, this is my first experience of the property or the organisation. And I'm really interested to know more about, well, why is it yes and why is it no? And it's very important to me that people provide me with as much detail as possible in this um, document because this is the document against which I'm auditing. So this is the document I send, I tell uh, people that I'm going to use this document as my base document for the audit. So the more information we can get in there, the more um, helpful it is and also the better the audit will go because I'm not actually asking the same questions over and over again. I can say, ah, oh, so, you know, you said here, um, Sorry. That's all right. Cool. Yeah. Okay, somebody's Something doing their washing or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let's take an example. Uh, I'm going to come back to that one. Is oh, I just want to find something where I can say. So, is there a commitment to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions? And somebody will say yes. Well, and then I go, and? <laughs> what I want there is, what is your commitment? How do you show that commitment? What is the evidence that tells me that you are committed to uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction? So, you might say that you are um, managing, how you're managing your energy. You might have things in place where you are using energy saving devices. All of this is really good stuff. And what we really want to know is more of it. So tell me what you're doing. Yes is good, but information for to support the yes is even better. And so I will then question you more about that when I get to, to audit. So I'm going to talk more about the self-assessment checklist, but basically as much information as possible there. Now, what does the self-assessment checklist tell me? Well, it tells me, ultimately, when I start the audit, is how ready are these people uh, for what's happening here? If I don't get a lot of information, I don't pass judgment on it. It's just, it means I have to work a lot harder at the audit, but I don't mind doing that. That's absolutely fine. But often, I find more often than not that people are selling themselves short. It's not that they aren't doing it. They are doing fantastic things. They just haven't actually told you what they're doing. So we just have to work hard to get that done. So if people are using this as a preparation for an audit, my suggestion would be give, lot, give me lots of information. Give the auditor as much information as you can. And at audit, be prepared to show what you've got during the audit. So 
Okay, let's try this. So, after I get the documentation, then I send a, a quite a detailed introductory email. And the idea is, first of all, to say um, who I am, but secondly is to say, I'm going to use this document, the self-assessment checklist, at audit, so just be prepared. The other thing I like to say is, can you set aside a room where we can work? Now, there are lots of different ways of doing an audit, but for me, the most efficient way is to go into where the documentation is. If I then have to run around the building trying to find documentation, that is not going to work well in a, in a one day, particular one-day audit. Uh, and it also means that we are hunting for things during the audit which dis distracts from actually getting the information that we actually need. So being organised prior to an audit is really important. Uh, the importance of a dedicated room will clearly um, you need a room where you have access to the internet, particularly people are going to show you electronic records, and also a place where you won't be disturbed. And the importance of having access to all documents. Well, as I've described, if you don't have access, or people say, oh no, they've been archived, that's always a point where I think, oh no, oh no, not the archive. <laughs> um, it usually means somebody has to run across town or you know, do something really outrageous to get something or dig around in the cellar, you know. It's just not a good look, so we just need to get the documents in one place at one time. So, I also, in the um, audit plan particularly, I provide uh, an attached audit plan to the introductory email, which outlines pretty much every document that needs to be there. So look at that, that's a real giveaway. You know, these are the kind of things that I think you should have in the room with you. And also, it outlines exactly where I think we should go in, during the walk around. Because the audit will be divided in two things, documentation review and the walk around. Usually about half and half. Sometimes the documentation will take a little bit longer, but whatever time, whether it's a one day, two day, four day audit, that's pretty much how the division goes. So, I, prior to audit, I review the self-assessment checklist the other thing I get sent, which I spend a lot of time on, is the benchmarking raw data, which I get sent. Now, I know that the, the, the organisation will, uh, will get sent a performance report, and I do look at that, but it's the raw data I'm really after, because that's where all the calculations are made for benchmarking. Uh, I also look at the risk assessment, environmental action plan. I also look at previous benchmarking and audit reports. And any other information I happen to get, I might get the waste management plan, I might get the complaints handling uh, procedure, as a few things like that. And honestly, the more information people want to send me, the happier I am. Because it just means I'm not spending time at audit trying to read documents. I've actually had them beforehand, and I'm ready to go when I get there. And the other thing I try and do, if I can, uh, is if I can get there the night before, which I do try and do, because clearly it's a much better thing to do to be on site. I actually try and either visit the site or go and have a look just at the location. I don't necessarily go into the site, but I just want to just see roughly, you know, what's the surrounding environment like. I might go and have a walk around and just see what I can do and see what I can see. So my audit day. I'm pretty much a creature of habit because I've learned through experience that this seems to work for me, not for every order, but I like to arrive early at the site because I like to set up everything. I will bring my laptop, maybe I'll bring, certainly bring my iPad and a few other bits and pieces, but I like to make sure that everything's working prior to the actual start time of the audit. And I also like to make sure that, um, you know, I found it, I know where I'm going and also that um, I don't, uh, um, want any surprises. I'm not a good surprise person on audit day. I like to know what's going on. So, and I also like to check that all the documents are in one place and also that people aren't um, missing, you know, like sometimes you arrive and somebody's gone off sick and oh, you know, this is this is going to be interesting. How are we going to manage this? But I like to do it early, then we all know what's going to happen. Now, as I said, the audit gets divided into two parts, documentation review and site walk around. So, now, as I've said, and I'm going to keep saying, the key document we use is the self-assessment checklist. And all I do is work my way through the self-assessment checklist. It's a pretty straightforward procedure. So if people want to know what I'm going to do in an audit, 
all I do is start at page one at the policy and I off I go. I do actually look at the scope statement and a few other things, but pretty much I start from the policy and say, rightio, show me your policy. And I've <laughs> got the policy usually, but I, what I'm looking for actually in the first time when I ask people to show me the policy is show me the policy which is signed and dated, hopefully signed by a senior person within the organisation and dated within the last 12 months. That's what I'm after. But so I just go through policy, benchmarking, compliance, the, uh, approach, performance and communication. I just basically get this thing out and off we go. So those of you, some of you have been with me on audits, that's pretty much how it goes. Not rocket science, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's one, one question, yes. so I know we're saying self-assessment checklist, but for those people who aren't actually OCHEC members, the self-assessment checklist is actually really the, the, the user interface that we use that maps to our company standard. So what's contained within okay. the company standard is um, put into a user interface within our software, uh, which we then call the self-assessment checklist. They interact with the software, providing yes or no's and more commentary uh, if we can. And then once that's submitted, you get it as a report when we move through. Correct. And I, I think, uh, thanks for raising that, it's a really good point. I think the self-assessment checklist is embedded within the company standard. Now, my advice would be to anybody who's going forward to audit is actually I would fill out the self-assessment checklist prior to coming uh, to uh, sending it to you, EarthCheck, with the company standard in your hand because the company standard actually provides you with a lot of really yep. useful information yep. about how to fill out the self-assessment checklist. So personally, I would make sure that everybody who's um, involved in, and hopefully it's more than one person, in filling out the self-assessment checklist uh, actually has a copy of the company standard. And that's another thing to say before we launch ourselves into this. This is not a job for one person sitting in an office somewhere filling out the self-assessment checklist. This, because it requires, as we, as we go through it, you will see how much detail is required. And there are lots of different people within an organisation who can make a contribution to the information in the self-assessment checklist. I've been asked in the past how it should be done. Well, clearly everybody chooses, but my view is offer people food and get them into a room <laughs> and get them to sit down and talk to each other about how to answer some of these questions. It's a lonely job if you're the one who's been left holding. When the music stopped, you did not have a chair and you ended up having to fill out the self-assessment checklist by yourself. I think it's much better. It should be done really by the green team. That's who I would recommend doing it. And I also think that it should be done, if you like, with dialogue. Uh, it's very hard to answer all of those questions by yourself. You need people like the chief engineer or the maintenance guy or whoever's. You need the HR people there. You need the accountant there. You need all sorts of people to help fill this out. It's not a one-person job. I'll talk a bit more about that when it comes up, the green team comes up. But clearly this is a big task and it needs to be done, I think, by more than one person. Anyway, so launching ourselves into that. So my job with the policy is, so we get the policy out, we look at it and we say, does this policy comply with all the requirements of the standard? So we're looking at section one, either in the company standard or the self-assessment checklist, and I basically go through and tick off all the bits that it's asking for. Has it been signed by senior management? Well, to me, that's a really important thing. The policy is such an important document because it's the commitment of the organisation to sustainability and to themselves and to improving their performance. So what you're looking for, me as the auditor, I'm looking for sign-on by senior management. And there's a big difference as to who signs on to this thing. You know, who's, who is going to take the pivotal role? Everything comes from senior management basically. So what, that's what I'm looking for is someone, a senior person who has said, I'm going to be the EarthCheck champion. I'm the one who's going to stand up and I'm going to put my name to this. And the policy is where everything flows from. And I think when you get that commitment from senior management, it really makes everything work so much better. Oops. Um, has the policy been uh, dated within the last 12 months? It's just a requirement of the standard that it is. And also you want to make sure that people are keeping up to date and, and reviewing as they go. Have key stakeholders 
been identified. This is a big problem, in, can be a big problem. This is about identifying who key stakeholders are in an organisation. Now, key stakeholders, the internal ones, like your staff, are always identified, but we don't work in a vacuum. We, every organisation, every property, has an influence on external stakeholders, and we need to identify those stakeholders. So they can be your neighbours, they can be other parts of the community, they can be local government, they can be a whole raft of people who are your suppliers particularly, are your external key stakeholders. So what, what that exercise does is have you even thought about who you interact with within the community and have you identified those people? So we're looking for a list of key stakeholders. It can be supplier lists, it can be customer lists, it can be whatever people want. There's not a right way of answering these questions. Everybody will do it differently. But the essence of the question needs to be answered. And that's really what I'm looking for there. So why is the identification? Well, I've just mentioned that. Basically, we, are, we influence things around us in particular ways. And certainly internally, but externally, we influence. I've seen the influence of properties where they have a very strong sustainability approach. And then their suppliers pick it up. And they start becoming more sustainably aware. And they start doing their own environmental things. And this is like a chain reaction. So it's really important. I don't think people realize the kind of influence they have in their local networks. And I think it's a very important part of this thing. So policy, we just go through, we tick off the bits. Have they legal compliance? Have they made a commitment to local products and services? All of those things, and we just tick them off. It's pretty straightforward. But those stakeholder issues. Now, the other thing is, is the policy on display and available to all key stakeholders? Well, this is a big one. First of all, if you haven't identified your stakeholders, often it's likely you won't have been putting your policy on display for them because you haven't actually identified them. But often we find people are telling the staff about, you know, they're putting the policy up on display, but in the in staff canteen or places like that. But the guests are, are really important too. They need to be able to see it. And the suppliers and the, you know, the local government people and whoever you're interacting with all become important parts of this. So one way is to clearly is to potentially put it up on your website or um, certainly put it on display if you can in the, in the front area. I'd be proud of this. I think it's a wonderful statement and I think it's, a, it's not something to be hidden, it's something to be put out there. So, but, you know, people can be inventive about how they do this, but it is really important that it is on display or available and or available to people. So, the common errors, well, clearly the policy doesn't conform to the standard, i.e. it doesn't have all the bits it should have, which is clearly laid out in the standard. External stakeholders haven't been identified. It's not on display for all key stakeholders, and it hasn't been reviewed within the last 12 months. Those are key and common problems with um, the policy, and it's not rocket science. It's pretty much follow what's required and just make sure you've covered up all the bits. Right, benchmarking. Oh, this is always fun. I enjoy benchmarking. <laughs> benchmarking can be a terrible experience and a fantastic experience all at the same time because it really depends on how organised people are in terms of the data. And it can often be the longest part of the documentation review. So I go into an organisation, I have a raw data file, basically a big spreadsheet which tells me what people have said, their energy, water and waste, um, and other things, but primarily energy, water and waste usage have been in the last year. Now, my job is to, to match, to verify the data provided to EarthCheck. Now, the only way I can do that really is from the bills, the invoices provided, or if they are producing and generating on their own site, their own engineering readings, which will do that as well. So there's a number of different ways to do this, but the common issue is, um, people not having the data in, uh, in the room or um, having the wrong year. I've had a few of those. Oh, sorry, wrong year. Oh, whoops, never mind. Uh, and uh, a few other things like that. But we usually get there. But then I have to take the, um, 
the invoice data and match it up against the monthly data. Now, people have very unique ways sometimes of managing their data, and they change the units, sometimes the measurement units, or they put meter readings instead of the measurement units, and it can get really complicated. So, basically all we can do is follow along from the invoices and try and match. Doesn't always happen, but in the main we can usually do it if the invoices are all there and they haven't been sent archives, you know, 20 miles down the street. So that's usually a problem. But we just need them in place and then I need to be able to match them across. I don't match every all every month. If I can just take a sample, I'll just take four months and then try and make sure if those four figures um, are good, then it looks like we can move on to the next thing. So, so I'll just accept that. If I find an issue, then I can end up having to do to go through uh, all 12 months because I, I can't actually work out what the variation is. We have a 10% um, variation around the, the figure that they've submitted. So as long as I'm within that, then it's okay. If not, then if I find where the error is, then it'll have to be resubmitted and it becomes a, a non-conformance at that point. Now. There are so many things I could say about benchmarking. I could be here all afternoon. So I think I'm going to move on. I think I've given you the flavour. I don't think I need to beat this drum anymore. <laughs> now, the activity uh, measure is probably one of the most important um, calculations. Now, for example, in a property like a hotel, it's guest nights. But if you are a different kind of organisation, so there are sector benchmarking um, indicators for different groups. So it can be revenue per passenger kilometre, it can be um, nights on a cruise ship, it can be a whole range of things, it really depends. And this is the other thing I really like about Earthcheck. It's not just about hotels, it's about a whole range of activities. And there's so much thought that has gone into those sector benchmarking indicators. And there's so many things that people could do and measure. It, you know, I think there's a whole raft of things that people can actually do here. So. Um, the activity measure really determines all the other calculations, so we need to get that right. And um, sometimes we have some issues, but in the main, we can just get that right, that calculation, and we can move forward from there. Sector benchmarking data I've um, just mentioned. As I said, I'll do a sample, but if I, if I have find a problem, then 12 months, I'll have to do the lot. Okay, this is not moving. Had I gone to sleep? Ah, here we go, thank you. So, common issues at audit are, raw data submitted to Earthcheck does not match the invoices submitted for review during the audit. That makes my heart stop a bit. Uh, missing invoices, errors in calculation, errors in units of measurement, and I like, this one's one of my favorite. <laughs> the person who did the calculations is not available during the audit, and people attending the audit don't know what they did. That's always a good one. And that can be a bit of a showstopper until we can try and work out what, how they managed to do it. Or somebody gets on the phone and finds them and says, what did you do? And then we end up with a little hookup trying to work out what they did. <laughs> but um, we try and avoid that one if possible, and that is avoidable, but um, sometimes people just, it just happens. That the, uh, people are always sick is one thing, but people have actually left the organisation, that, that's something a bit more different. Anyway, it is what it is, and we just work around it, and we'll find a way to work our way through um, any of these issues. Now, so section three in the standard is about compliance. Now, this is always an interesting one. So, there, the organisation is required to develop a comprehensive legal register, which many people do, uh, and uh, there is a... Um, in the resources for EarthCheck, there's a model that people can follow if they need to get help as to how to develop uh, the comprehensive legal register. Now, this is really important. The original permits, license, leases, etc., should be available for review in the audit room. Um, the challenge is when they're hanging on a wall, and I'm only in five foot three and a half, and I have to go and clamber up something to try and read, you know, the bar license or something. So it's good if we could get them all in the one room at the time. Um, is there, for me, probably the most important question here is this. Is there a system in place to ensure that permits, licenses and leases are kept up to date? Who is responsible? 
Now, it's interesting, lots of people do this differently. So some people make it that the different departments are responsible for their own leases and licenses. Well, that's okay, except that it means that getting an overview, because people are caught up in all, this is not people's core business. Their core business is running stewarding or running the kitchen or doing whatever they do. So who is catching them if there is a, um, a delay or have they remembered to keep their licenses up to date? And um, you really need overarching work. And usually this job often falls within the accounting group who seem to have a, um, an overview, but not always. But really a master list is one way around that. And I think it's, you know, if people haven't got a system in place, I would encourage them to put some kind of overarching system in place to ensure that permits, licenses and leases do not become out of date because somebody's forgotten to uh, send in the money or, you know, to, to update them. So really important that that should happen. So common in, uh, issues, they have got a leadable register. It's, this is a very common one, it's out of date. Now, how do I know it's out of date? Well, clearly I look at it and I'm looking to see if pieces of legislation that I know should be in there aren't. Uh, or that they're using a, um, an act or something that was um, repealed or um, renewed or something that happened to it uh, more recently and they haven't recorded it. The other thing I think, or for, I'm going to say this, for me, all these things like um, registers of any kind should be dated. Uh, the risk assessment should be dated. There should be somewhere on the piece of paper that says what the date is and when it was last updated. The same for the environmental action plan, same for the legal register, same for the waste management plan, the plates handling plan. A lot of these things come to me undated. So it's very difficult for me to then determine, you know, what has been reviewed within the last 12 months. But also, it's very difficult for them to, to determine that up as well. And things just get left. So often with the legal register, you need to keep things up to date and you need to have a system in place that says, this is how we're going to update this. Now, in some cases, they have an outside organisation which sends them any relevant information that says this has been changed and somebody is responsible for updating it. But you need to have thought about the problem to determine how you're going to, to, to find a solution to that problem. Everybody comes up with a different solution. It doesn't have to be the one I'm suggesting. You can come up with anything you like so long as it's um, comprehensive and it um, captures things so they don't fall through the cracks. I'm really looking at the systems here. How are you going to do this? How will this make sure that you're always up to date? How will you um, not miss a change in legislation? So, and uh, the, the, the key really is no one has overall responsibility. If I can't find anybody who's got overall responsibility, I want to know how are they managing this? You know, what's happening here? How can they do this without anybody? You know, somebody needs to be keeping an overview of what's going on here. All right, now approach is a big section in the standard and a very important section in the standard. And it contains two really key documents. One is the risk assessment and one is the environmental action plan. Now under the Earth Checks program, people um, or organisations can be termed low risk or high risk depending on certain criteria, which are clearly laid down in the standard. So my job, first of all, is to see if they have picked the right one, whether they are really low risk or whether they're high risk. And to also, there's a series of questions we follow through. And then to ensure that they have a risk assessment in place. So has the correct risk assessment been done? Has the organisation identified aspects against the 10 key performance areas? Now, the 10 key performance areas, as you're aware, in the room with me, but maybe not outside, are the 10 key performance areas that are clearly laid down in the standard. And those 10 key performance areas, when people are doing the risk assessment, and again, this is not a one-person job. This is a job really for a group, and I would suggest, again, the green team would be the right people to come to, to do that together, because it's a very difficult task to do by yourself. You need to have different departments with you while you're thinking about risk. And particularly when you're looking at the 10 key performance areas, I'm just going to read them out because in case people are online and they don't actually know what we're talking about here. So in terms of the company standard uh, for EarthCheck, the 10 key performance areas are greenhouse gas emissions, energy efficiency, conservation and management, management of freshwater resources, 
ecosystem conservation and management, social and cultural management, land use planning and management, air quality protection, wastewater management, solid waste management, and environmentally harmful substances. So there are 10 key performance areas in it. But if people are interested in that and they're not familiar with these, I think you can go to your website and you'll find the um, EarthCheck um, 10 key performance areas there. So, yep. you're right. Yep. Uh, what you were... So, <laughs> have the stakeholders. So, has the organisation identified aspects against the 10 key performance areas? So, the 10 key performance areas, if you uh, look at them like that, they can actually form, if you like, the framework of your risk assessment. Mm -hmm. So you can look at things in terms of those matters and then determine your risks. And departmental uh, input is really vital in determining risk. So that would be how you would build a, a risk assessment. Now, this is the thing I say to people who are just coming into the process. You're not going to have an all singing, all dancing risk assessment in the first year. Risk assessments are things that are built through time and experience. So in the first instance, I would just go for the basics, you know, the key, the things that really stand out, and then develop that over time using your knowledge and your knowledge of sustainability and the EarthCheck program, but also drawing more people in the organization in to give you um, assistance in developing your risk assessment. So take it, you know, risk, I've been to an organization where they presented me with um, 34 risk assessments. But it was a huge audit, and I nearly had a heart attack, I can tell you. Uh, but it was a very, it was absolutely right for their organisation, because they had so many different activities going on. Clearly it was right. But you can start um, small and just build yourself into it, get, get more and more experience. Now, the risk assessment, in a risk assessment, you will have mitigation measures to manage that risk. They are actions that you take. Now, this is where you link the risk assessment and the environmental action plan, because the action plan needs to take the actions that you've said that you're going to use to mitigate that risk, and then you have an action plan that says, this is how we're going to do it. And the action plan then has responsibilities, timelines, deadlines, and overall responsibility. Someone is watching to make that happen. Those two things are absolutely key documents in working your, your system in terms of your EarthCheck program. So I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute. But the issue becomes often people don't make the, if you like, the link between the risk assessment and the environmental action plan. And that's what I'm looking for. Have people linked the two things together? And do they understand how the SMART work? And also, once you get it in place, it's a fantastic document. The, so you've got your risk assessment, you've got your action plan. Now your action plan then can become your agenda item for your green team meetings. So what you're doing then is taking the action plan and saying, right, yo, these are the things we're trying to achieve, this is what we want to do, and now when we go to our um, green team meetings, we've got something ready-made to talk about right there, right then, and we can look at progress against actions through time. Also, it then helps you with your review of have you been successful at the end of the day. So do you see how the things link together? And I think it's really important. Sometimes people don't get that yet, uh, you know, early in the piece. But if they can start developing that system, it should really help them going forward. So now this is a big problem. I wonder a big problem, but it certainly um, pops up a lot. Have stakeholders been consulted during the development of the risk assessment? Remember I said we are not an island? <laughs> uh, what it means is internally, people have recognised their stakeholders as the staff. And the staff often contribute to the development of risk assessment. However, bearing in mind that you are, um, there are external stakeholders, and some risks will relate to things that happen around your site and off your site, then those people need to be consulted as well in terms of the development of the risk assessment, because they will have things to add. Now, people have often said to me, well, we don't want to send our risk assessment out to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Um, I'm fine with that. I don't expect people to send out that. But what I do expect people to do is to consult with relevant issues with the key external stakeholders. What I'm saying to them is you need to recognise that you have an influence outside of this, but also that these people can contribute to your identification of risk and what, what the, might that risk be. And I think that is um, a really important part of being part of the community 
you know, how Earthcheck really differs, I think, from ISO 14001, particularly, is this issue of social and community connection. And I, I note now that the new ISO 14001 is actually going down, more going down that path. But I think, see, Earthcheck, we're ahead of the game there. Uh, and I think this is really important that um, this is a way that, of, of engaging with community and engaging with external stakeholders and really getting input into your process going forward. And particularly, I mean, the risk assessment, the action plan, it comes up again in community liaison in section six. But um, I think this is where identification of your key stakeholders becomes a really important part of developing your EarthCheck program. Have you yeah. Yes, yeah, you know, yes, absolutely. Yeah. One of the things I think of, how about this? Uh, I was thinking, I knew somebody would ask this question, so I, <laughs> I came with an answer prepared. Um, one of the things, how about this? I've been sometimes um, properties share common boundaries and common systems like mm -hmm. car parks, waste bins, stuff like that. Sure. So there are risks associated with waste management and also with um, car parks. Let's just take car parks, for example. So say somebody has a common boundary with a car park, they share a car park. The issue then becomes, the risk is collision in the car park and an environmental spill of some kind. Could be oil, it could be petrol. So what we need to do is perhaps talk to our neighbours about, okay, spill kits. Who's responsible? What kind of training are we going to give people? Who's running the car park? Is it us? Is it them? How, how are we going to respond in terms of an environmental emergency which might involve a collision in the car park? Now that takes into account not only um, it's um, the section 4.24 4 of the standard asks the risk assessment to take in oh, <laughs> to take in. You um, uh, know it so well. <laughs> certain parts of it to take into account emergency and accidental situations. So as part of the risk assessment, and often it's a thing that's forgotten. And collisions in a car park, chemical spills, all of those kind of things become part of that emergency and accidental situations. But also, if you share a common boundary with your neighbour or your neighbour is sharing a car parking, or even if they aren't, and they, it is in my experience that these kind of situations occur at 12 midnight on a Saturday night when nobody's around and you need to know that everybody knows where the spill kit is. Not only do they know where it is, but how do they use it? So this is a really, and often it's not, you know, the people who get the training are often, you know, the people in engineering and so forth, but actually it's the front office staff who need it. They're the people on the desk and somebody's coming in screaming, look, look, there's a problem in the car park. And this poor person on the, you know, the duty manager or something has not got any idea what's going on. So those people need the training as well, okay? But you can see where the crossover lies. You've got, you identify the risk, you need to consult with your uh, key external stakeholders. And the external stakeholders then understand your process. These are our mitigation measures. They might say, well, look, what happens if it is 12 noon and we can't get to the spill kit? You know, if you lock it up or whatever, uh, how are we going to get there? So they need a key or they need some process in place. They need to know that the key is kept, you know, under the desk, or, you know, at the front desk or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But that, I think, gives you some. The other thing, too, is things like pick up, bin pickups, waste management, all of that stuff. Often people share common areas with that. So that's where your neighbours would come into play. Okay, so, um, has, oh, have stakeholders been concerned with risk assessment considered potential emergency and accidental situations? Well, often I'm asked, well, what kind of things? Because people think I'm completely bonkers at this stage. But there are quite a few. One, the other area I think that really needs a risk assessment is, um, Management of pool chemicals. You know, there have been a couple of incidents where um, there's been an unfortunate mix of chemicals and then this cloud, this chemical cloud has passed over the guests, uh, not to their, um, uh, yes, anyway, not to their benefit, let's say. And so it's important that uh, those kind of issues are thought about in terms of emergency and accidental situations. Gas leaks is another issue. What are you going to do if, what are your mitigation measures? Those kind of things. Is, I really have a thing about this. I, this is just me, Kathy has a thing about this, but I really want everything dated. It drives me potty when I find things that have been dated. And has it been reviewed within the last 12 months? It's really important to me that people keep, you know, risks change, things happen. So we need to keep on top of it. 
Now, the common issues, um, clearly people haven't considered all 10 key performance areas. So the 4.2.3 is hasn't considered the views of external stakeholders, which is very common and very often there's a non-conformance, and hasn't considered potential emergency and accident situations again. I mean, there are lots of things that happen in a risk assessment, but those are two key ones if people are interested in that. Okay. So we're still in approach, and the Environmental Action Plan is, I've had a little conversation about that, but is, is there one in place? This is important. Does it include responsibilities, i.e. is somebody responsible for making that action happen? Timeframes. Um, ongoing, I know, is used a lot, but I think it could be, uh, an ongoing is clearly okay, but timeframes just, uh, it helps if you have a set time frame for how you're going to do something or in up to a review, you know, ongoing for the next 12 months we will review it on X and Y or Z. Targets, so are we setting some targets here, you know, we're going to reduce waste by X and when are we going to do it by and what are we going to do and how will we know if we've done it? And a way to verify results, so how are we going to know if we've achieved our target? These open-ended uh, things are a problem in that you can never know if you're ever going to get to the end of it. So having some clear way of verifying, you know, what to you is success? And everybody has a different view of that, you know, what, what is success? And you as an organisation can choose that, that's fine. Nobody's saying how it, you do it. You need to choose something that works for you as an organisation. Is it dated? I won't go there again. Has it been reviewed annually? And key to me is, is it linked to the risk assessment? And often people see them as two completely separate, um, separate items. So, common issues, it's not complete, doesn't contain responsibilities, targets and time frames, it's not linked to the risk assessment. Um, <clears throat> and I've said, it, the risk assessment must contain the mitigation actions, they should be in the EAP and they must be linked. And my suggestion is, for people, is that they monitor the action plan through regular meetings. So they can take the action plan to the meeting and say, well, where are we up to with this, what are we doing with this? And then at the end of the year, you then have almost a clear um, review report written because you've been following it through time. And I think it just saves on having lots of different meetings where you can actually follow this through time. Now, this uh, part, again, is in, in approach section four. So we've got, um, <clears throat> here I'm required to look at the EarthCheck coordinator, who's been nominated for that, whether they've been formally appointed. Now, people say, well, you know, we, well, John told me yesterday that I'm the Earth Check coordinator. <laughs> well, good, good. But what we really want, this is like a commitment. This is, again, like, it's like signing the policy. It's a commitment by senior management. It's not given to the poor person who didn't have a chair when the music stopped. It's somebody who actually has been identified as the Earth Check coordinator. It doesn't mean that they're the only person who ever does anything Earth Check ever again. It means that they've got a team of people around them and they are going to lead. And this is really important. So they're required to have some form of training, you know, some proof of training. So be it and can be often, I think some of the best training you can get is to, you know, do uh, the webinars that I think EarthCheck uh, are allow, uh, help you to do and so forth. The other thing I'm looking for is the green team, whether the green team is in place, but not just the green team is in place, who's on it? Not necessarily the people, but where are they from? Are they from all from HR? Or are they all from you know maintenance? Or are they spread through the organisation? I'm looking for a spread. I'm looking for a rep, really, from every department within the organisation. Because this is an organisational thing. This doesn't happen just in one corner of the organisation. Often it's left to a corner of the organisation, but it needs to be out there, and everybody needs to be making a contribution. This is really important. And are they reporting to senior management? Now, this again is important because it shows me, and it can be verbal reports, it can be, depending on the size of the organisation, but one of the things I'm really wanting to know is, are senior management interested in what's happening here? You know, are they following? I really like it when senior management are on the green team, because to me, that says they're keeping their finger on the pulse and they know what's going on. So, staff training, this again comes into approach. This is a really important part of, uh, of the audit. 
Now, every staff usually goes through some form of induction training. And we ask that the policy and the risk assessment and the sustainability approach are included in that induction training. So I'm not just looking at whether they have induction training, I'm looking at what's in it. No, no, it's fine. Um, so I'm looking to see if what's in actually in the training. So does it talk about the policy? Does it talk about the risk assessment? Does it talk about the, the approach? So often I find it doesn't actually talk about, uh, sometimes they mention the policy, sometimes they don't, but I think it's really important that they have it front and centre, the policy and the risk assessment. Often the risk assessment doesn't get mentioned either, and I think it should. <coughs> now, is there a way of ongoing training to support staff in their environmental management responsibilities? Now, this ongoing training is interesting because often it can be on the job training, which is absolutely fine, but I'm looking to see what, how do we support people going forward? So in induction, we say, right, oh, this is our commitment, but how do we support these people you know, as they go forward in their work and things change and do we have refresher courses and how do we um, keep them how do we, housekeeping staff, there's a quite a high turnover often in housekeeping people. So the induction training is one thing, but we need to keep these skills up and we need to help them go forward. People forget things and, you know, all sorts of things. But we need to, you know, is there a process in place? Does the Earth Check Coordinator provide additional training through time? I'm, I'm certainly interested in seeing if that happens. And review evidence that the risk assessment are reviewed and updated annually. There's nothing wrong with me. I just keep coming back to the same points over and over again. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Now, the common issues are the green team is not in place and or it's not functioning. So sometimes the green team has been nominated, but they haven't met for, you know, <laughs> a long time. So that would be my not functioning uh, process. Um, and sometimes people just got completely overwhelmed. And that is... Very common. People are busy, busy, busy. You know, this is organisations, you know, especially if you're in a large hotel or a large organisation and, you know, you just haven't met for a while. So I do look to see, you know, how often are they meeting? When did they last meet? I look for the minutes of the meetings mm -hmm. just to see what's going on. And this is where your action plan can really help you, you know, keep you on track. Often the staff induction doesn't include the policy risk assessment and overall long-term sustainability approach. Often it will just include the approach, but not the other things. So I'm looking for all three. Oh, and I have said the same thing again, so I'll just stop saying that. <laughs> all right. So the environmental management system I'm not going to spend time on today. It's a talk all in and of itself. It's a very, it's not a complex business, but it's for properties that are considered to be high risk. Now, if property is considered to be high risk and they've not got an EMS in place, then EarthCheck have a fantastic resource which gives them a framework as to how they can develop an EMS. And again, an EMS, often uh, when you first start, uh, it can be quite basic and you can just put all the bits in and you can build. But people get quite overwhelmed, I think, sometimes by EMSs. It doesn't have to be war and peace. It just has to have the bare bones. You can get the bare bones, you can get help for the bare bones, and then you start building. And things become <clears throat> clearer to you as you get more and more into the process. So that's all I'm going to say on that. Now, this is one of my favorite sections of this thing because this is all about performance. This is really where the rubber meets the road. How are people managing their energy? How are they managing their water? How are they managing their waste? And I find this uh, a really important and uh, interesting part of the audit. Because at this point, a lot of this stuff, the performance stuff, I would actually review during the walk around. But the questions, and this is where the self-assessment checklist detail really needs to come in here. Now, um, basically we've talked about the 10 key performance areas. And the common issues here are properties not providing answers to the questions, not giving enough detail. Now, a lot of... <laughs> Sometimes people identify issues as not applicable when they are. So I find that interesting. And so I usually pick that pre-audit and then I might ask them a question about it. But for example, stormwater management. Even you know, if you have a building, you're managing stormwater, you can't not manage it because it's running off your building and it's going somewhere. So um, I think it's just really thinking about where you are in terms of the environment 
and what that actually means. And um, cultural engagement, I mean, you know, clearly this is an international standard. And for some people, cultural engagement would be much more prominent for others. But everybody has some form of community engagement, social engagement of some kind. So I think there are things that can be answered in that section which relate to that kind of community engagement. Um, the thing I wanted to bring in here, which is the new thing which I am very interested in, which is this energy check that EarthCheck are um, going to introduce. I don't know, do you want to talk about this, Linda, or do you want me to? No, you're, you're okay with me doing it? Yeah. All right. This is actually a fantastic innovation, I think, from EarthCheck where energy, um, so what we're going to be doing uh, as an auditor, what I'm going to be doing, is actually verifying information that organisations provide on their plant and equipment. Now, this is really interesting to me because I really like boilers and fridges and you know, chillers and <laughs> waste bins and compactors and things like that. You know, I personally find that actually quite interesting. But I also think that it's a wonderful way for organisations to really get to grips with the kind of plant equipment they've got on site, but also how effective is it in functioning, and is this giving them the performance they want? And also, it allows organisations to find out, you know, well, I don't think they'll find out, but they can certainly look at what others have, but not, not uh, in the sense of um, actually seeing the equipment, but more understanding where improved performance can come from with different plant and equipment. And I think ultimately that's where you're going to head with that. Yeah. And I think this is great because this is sharing of ideas, sharing of information, sharing of knowledge, which allows people to um, really look and see well, what other people have been doing, what, what's their performance been like. Really, we're getting down to the bottom line here. You know, yes, we are um, supporting the environment and so forth and sustainability, but ultimately, too, there is a, a bottom line component of this which allows people to perform better and save themselves money and so forth. And I think, you know, we have to look at that in terms of the performance of the organisation. I'm sure they do. So this, this energy check uh, will be introduced when? We've started to do some pilots with some properties already. Right. So, um, Excellent. So from the perspective towards the end of the year. Perfect. So this energy check, so will um, be, it's, Pilot properties, uh, pilot properties have already gone into place, but we're being, we're, we as the auditor will be asked then, so people will tell us what they've got on site, and then we will come in and um, just uh, have a look at it and uh, check it, and we might take some photographs, but it'll just build up a picture of the kind of plant and equipment that people have got on site, and I think will help provide lots of information for the clients going forward. And I'm actually looking forward to this bit. I think it'll be fun. Now, um, at performance, I'll leave performance there because I think I'm, how am I doing for time, guys? Do I need to hurry up? Okay, hurry up, Kathy. Right. <laughs> Fair enough, I can hurry. I'm good at hurrying. All right. Now, I'm going to spend about five minutes on this because this is one of the most important parts of this problem. For me, Almost every audit, a major non-conformance, is this management of environmentally harmful substances. Clearly, it is a problem for people all over the place, and it's you know, it, it's a problem everywhere, really. But it really is an issue that people have to get grips with because this is a huge risk and liability issue for any organisation. If you're not doing this properly, you have a problem, and it has a risk. It's, a, it's an oh &S issue, it's an environmental issue, but it actually is an oh &S issue. And it clearly makes my hair stand on end sometimes. So I find that um, this is not done well in many, many places. So the common issues that I see, uh, and, the, and this section is a major cause of non-conformances during the audit. So safety data sheets are not in place or out of date. Harmful substances are not being stored correctly. And clearly, they're being stored often in areas where they shouldn't be stored. There is no um, chemical storage area, or they're being stored near open drains, or you know, there's a whole raft of things, or they're being stored stacked so high that you can just go in there and they can all fall over. Um, personal protective equipment is not available for staff. This is a really big problem, and particularly if people have um, 
chemicals, even cleaning chemicals, kitchen chemicals, the chemicals that they use to clean ovens are highly corrosive. Now, if you have a corrosive class 8 chemical, it can cause, and you splash it on yourself, it can cause a full thickness skin burn if you're not careful. This is really serious stuff, and I, I'm all over it. If I see this happening on a site, I will immediately tell the senior person there that this needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed quickly. And PPE, or personal protective equipment, are things like gloves, aprons, boots, um, eye protection, face protection, hearing protection. They need to be there and available. Now, I know that these things walk. So people put them in place and then somebody takes home the wellies for the weekend or whatever. <laughs> I know it happens, but it doesn't matter. It has to be replaced. Somehow you have to find a system for making sure that stuff stays on site. Chemical spill kits need to be in place. And not only do they need to be in place, somebody needs to know how to use them. Training, it, chemical, the training issue for chemical handling has to be kept up all the time. New staff must be trained. The area of risk and liability here is huge for any property. The first thing that will happen if you have an accident, the first thing that happens is they come in and they go straight to your training records. Almost immediately they will go to your training records and to your chemical storage processes and procedures. And they won't be asking, you know, because somebody, somebody was away, they'll be saying, where is it? I want it, I want it now. And it's really important that this is done. So. Spill kit training hasn't been undertaken, or spill kits aren't in place, or somebody has gone in and pinched the vital parts of the spill kit. Uh, so you open up, it says spill kit, and you open up and it's empty. Or, I went to a place once and I opened up the spill kit and it had a toilet roll in it. <laughs> what are you going to use this for, chaps? And everybody really shuffled, looked very, um, yes, very embarrassed. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so the toilet rolls are always left. <laughs> Staff chemical training has not been untaken without a date. Unsealed drains. <laughs> Chemicals being stored in not fit for purpose areas or um, containers like filing cabinets. You know, you can't store chemicals in filing cabinets. It's like, what the? You know? <laughs> and no list of harmful substances with disposal options. Now, this is more of the environmental side of things, but the disposal options are really important from an environmental perspective. It's not just getting the stuff on site, it's what are you going to do when you finish with it? How are you going to get rid of all this stuff? Paint. What are you going to do with the paint before, you know, how are you going to get rid of this thing? And so I'm really, uh, batteries, all of these things, harmful substances is not just chemicals. It's all these other things that can harm the environment. So you really need to, to get across that. All right. Energy check, I've discussed. Communication. So this is section six. Now this is a really important part of the standard. This is all about social community liaison. And often people kind of, you know, just brush over it. But actually I think it's a really important part of the standard and needs to be addressed. So, and particularly in areas like um, community consultation, customer satisfaction, how do people complain? Is it, it's, it's such a well-kept secret that they can never find out how they have to do it. You know, is it something, so we never get new complaints because nobody can find us. Um, encouraging participation and informing customers and raising awareness. Those three things. This is where an organisation can really have a huge impact. Because if you celebrate um, Earth Hour, uh, Clean Up Australia Day, World Environment Day, you can send something out to all your clients and you can get the guests involved. You know, and this is where you make a big difference, I think. I'm very keen to see what community projects, and often properties are absolutely onto this. They are doing so much work for the community, but they don't actually tell anybody what they're doing. I've seen people supporting all sorts of them, local schools, local um, football clubs, local communities, they have art displays, they have all sorts of things going on, and you never hear about it. So I'm really interested in people showing me what they do, and they do some really, really great work. And they should really show people and, and let people know. Now, I know I'm running a bit late, so I'm just going to keep on. Can we, uh, common issues here, again, all of this stuff with um, key external stakeholders, consultation has to be undertaken. This is what the standard states. The organisation shall consult with key stakeholders on the significant aspects against the 10 key performance areas. It's not just for the risk assessment, it's just being part of the community and consulting with people. 
That's a quote from the standard, from section six of the standard. So you're required to make some form of communication about your key performance areas. The place handling policy and procedure are not publicly available. Feedback on the policy has, and environmental program has not been sought. And major suppliers haven't been contacted in the last 12 months. So these are important parts of being an organisation and uh, really uh, con conforming to the EarthCheck standard. The social and community aspects are a really important part of that standard. Now, the walk around, again, is, is what it is. Basically, I list what I'm going to do and then I do it. I basically go around to all the key areas I can think of. Usually planting equipment, always behind house, kitchen areas, waste areas. Uh, if they've got garden areas, I'll go there, pool areas, spas, all sorts of things. The purpose of the walk around is to verify the claims. Some things like management of environmentally harmful substances can only be reviewed during the walk around. And I'll also be using that walk around to check the energy check processes, the chillers and the plants and the fridges and so forth. So after the closing, after the walk around, there's a closing meeting. Now, this is a really important part of the audit because at this meeting, I will tell the client what I think the non-conformances are. And it's a chance for the client to say either, I've, you know, I haven't understood, which is fine, or to question me further, or, but I never walk away from a site without them actually knowing what the outcome of the audit is. I don't think any surprises aren't part of it. Uh, my job is to tell people and give people a chance to tell me if I've missed something. I always ask at the end of the audit, is there something else you need to tell me that I haven't, or you think I haven't understood, or have I not listened, or, you know, tell me what you, is there anything unsaid that needs to be said right now? Uh, because I don't want them to have any surprises at the end of the audit. It's really important. This is a really important part of the audit. I like to discuss my findings, so there's no, and we clear up any issues. And the report that I write then will just confirm what we have agreed to at the audit. And it allows people to know that there'll be no surprises coming down the, the track. All right. Very important, I think. So the final report, I take the eye auditor um, uh, template and I, um, I've been typing into it as I've been going around off the site. By the way, during the audit, I'm very happy for people to look at whatever I'm typing. It's absolutely fine. It's not a secret. You can see my notes. They can talk to me. I often, I do make paper notes sometimes too, but I always allow, um, um, it's not a question of allowing. As far as I'm concerned, my audit notes are absolutely open for anybody to read anytime during the audit uh, whatever I'm doing because it's about them and they need to know that and if I've got it wrong I might have them saying no no we didn't say that we said this <laughs> personal whatever you know it's fine for that I think it's much better to have it done then than you know later yeah I don't think it, and I think you should be really open you know I think it's really important to be open and let them see exactly what you're doing and I often get the person next to me if I'm typing so they can see what I'm writing and so I send the final report to Earthcheck for review if they're satisfied that I've captured, captured what was there, but more conformed with what was required from an earth check report, then they'll forward it to the client. If they're major non-conformities, they'll be um, addressed in the progress review of corrective actions, which is an earth check process. Which will take, all that happens there is the major non-conformities are dealt with. There are three months to deal with the major non-conformities. The minor non-conformities can be dealt with within 12 months. So, I think oh, I'm finished. So, that's me. So, well done. <laughs> Sorry, I went on a bit. Sorry about so, that. So, there's no. So, look, can I can I just um, summarise um, some of the key issues here, and also put some observations back to the table. So, so the first one is that was an extremely powerful presentation. You know. And now you know why Cathy did teaching in an earlier life. You can see some of the, the, the teacher coming uh, out on that. But you know, so I, my first thing I wrote down was, what a great reality check. Because we talk about these things, but quite honestly, I don't think we, in, in the, if number six is about communication, I don't think we communicate as effectively as we could with some of our clients about the role of auditors and the role of audit. Because what you saw in that presentation was very pragmatic. It's about the commerciality. It's about actually protecting the client. That's why we do these things. 
So, you know, I guess what came out of that was to me some very pragmatic things that we can share with our clients. And I've got a few observations about what that might look like. Um, but almost to the fact that we can break this, I mean, it's almost to me a prerequisite before we go to audit that they should actually break this into two bits that Kath is, and they should listen to this presentation before you go into an audit. And we should share this with our clients. Uh, because I don't think we'd be able to do justice, being quite honest about it, unless you've actually got Kathy there in that presentation. So before you move into an audit, watch these two 30-minute presentations and it will clearly articulate the nature about why we do this and also how we can work with you. It's supposed to be a mutual thing, we're working together. I guess the other, so in coming of that, we do that for a number of reasons. And, and a key part of, of Kathy's presentation was built along a number of things, risk, pretty much built in everything, you know, the whole context of protecting their people and their brand and their operations, the whole context about quality assurance. I mean, all this fits back to a quality assurance platform, which is built off ISO that we pick up. Um, the fact that it's actually about delivering outcomes, we call them performance outcomes, and that's why we have 10 key performance areas. And the key word that Cathy used there, and I think it's a powerful one, is that we provide a framework for action. That's why you do Earth check. It provides a guided framework that you can report to and most importantly, your management can work with. That's yes. the whole idea of doing yes. this. It's not like we, we decided all these things needed to be done. There's an outcome to them. Start, and I thought probably the last couple of observations was, and guess what? You mightn't get it right from day one. Now, now Carmen from Langham talked about this at Inner Circle in Mexico. And what she said is sometimes, you know, guess what? We learn. And you learn by having auditors there who call it as it is. And that could well be, you know, guys, your risk needs to be updated. Your EMS is a starting point. That's okay. But next year, you should have been moving forward with the following things. We talk about communication of stakeholders. I think the pragmatic point is often they don't understand who stakeholders are. I've had many discussions yes. with GMs on this. Uh, and particularly the issue of shared responsibility, which is often the case where you have multi-strata tenancies mm -hmm. where, and, and I, one of our best clients, in which I won't mention who, I've had fantastic discussions with him over the years on, that's not my role, and our perspective is, yeah, it is. If you have not discussed that and you share a common tenancy, then there's a liability. Yeah. There, and there's a reason for that. You can't just say, well, that's not really what I thought was, you know, my, my demarcation is. And I think the, the other part about where Cathy was heading that we probably can work on in future is the whole context of this, the standard, and the things that we do are moving, always moving. The whole context of innovation, you know, the whole I auditor thing is, it was a fantastic asset for our auditors and also fantastic for us because we're learning in terms of the, the um, plant and equipment that sits behind these orders. The energy check process about understanding what is the plant and equipment that sits under a building, that's of, of in fact more importance for the client than us. And often we find the client doesn't know what in fact the chiller age is or profiling because honestly they've only been there two days themselves. We, so the issue is turnover, you know, turnover with your staff. So I guess I've got a couple of things for you. I'd love to be able to put Cathy on notice that we're going to come back to with some prompts because I know that you'll all go away and think about this. You know, particularly the RN managers. Um, I've got three observations um, in terms of the things that I, I would like to put to CAF, so I might as well put them up. And then I don't know if Andre has any from, from the no, floor. No, I noticed we just had one which was uh, more of an echo in the room, which was saying, I feel as though I was the one where the, the music finished and I was left with, the, with no chair. So uh, I think there's also that area of how we can help those stakeholders in, in understanding that they aren't on their own. And I think that's a role that we can take with our relationship management team and also how we engage the management and help them be supported. Look, I, I think so. so. So I wrote down here, I'm new to the company, right? How many times have you had this discussion? Yeah. I'm new to the company. Can you guys just tell me exactly what I should be doing? I think we could be a little bit more helpful with, honestly, John or Kathy, these are the three things you might you might start with. Just go there and read these things and come back to us because often they're busy and no one's given them an induction. We yeah. talk about the need for it and, and Kathy will be turning up to places where I've only been here a month, Kathy, honestly, you know, they didn't give me anything before I got here. So I think we can be a bit more helpful with induction. The simple things that 
if you were in a day company, what would you need to know in basic terms? The other thing that I think we can work with Kathy with in the audit is, is and they do this in other, so in, under the town planning schemes, the Department of Local Government often sends out um, what they call is, is um, policy updates. Mm. And the policy update is to say to the local authorities, look, fire, it's a major issue for your town planning area. Here's what you should have done if you're addressing fire. Now in our case, that fire is risk, okay? So, so the bottom line things that, that effectively, in, and Cathy talked about chemicals, okay? So, because often, uh, and I currently sort of working with a number of boards at the moment, and I said to Cathy this morning, was an interesting perspective on what actually often keeps people to the table is not love, but fear and greed. Okay, think about that. So the fear is, honestly, I didn't realise there was a liability. No one ever told me that these issues need to be addressed. Well, they do. And when something happens, they're going to come looking for you. So I'll turn that into a positive. Fear is helping people understand how you mitigate that. Okay, but if they don't know about it, they can't take action. So even to get Cathy to come back to us and say, well, here's three things we could do in the next six months that you can send out people saying, Here's what our auditors find out in the field. Here are the three common issues we have concerns with. One is about chemicals. Here's the, here's the issues. And how many times have you read audit reports where bunding is of, of critical significance, <laughs> just to start with? Uh, secondly, the whole issue of stakeholders. I do think there's a discussion there because I honestly don't think most understand what that means, internal or external. Uh, and, and I guess Andre's favourite always is about communication because it's number six in our standard, but quite honestly, if, if there was ever a weakness, is the issue of what does that really mean in terms of what sort of communication and how you're, you're presenting things. So now that's, that's to put back to the table, because I think you'll have other ideas as RMs, and Cathy will, that if, if there were three things that we could send out to clients this year, 30 years of being in the sustainability businesses, this is what we've learnt, Here's what you need to be aware of. Maybe we could do that, just just like you would if you were sending it out as a policy instrument. Um, so, what else, guys? Anything that you've got? Observations, concerns, Marco? No, I think. Uh, thank you, Cathy, for the presentation. Um, very very thorough feedback, and, and that's always good to hear. Um, I was just actually thinking about something that's, that we don't currently do, but we know that companies actually have financial resources, which you know, they manage their cash flow, they manage their little bucket of, of resources. So potentially something that we haven't looked, and this is a completely fresh idea, is how do they actually invest those resources to make sure that they're not exposed to risks that derive from not considering environmental, social, governance aspects. Mm -hmm. So that's just a fresh idea, um, not actually related to what we've discussed today. We're just thinking about how we could continue to add value to our clients. Well, if it was James Lang, wouldn't you'd have a beta? You'd have a beta uh, under your valuation that said that's risk. That's why you get about how your valuations are done. But I guess that's what it speaks to. It speaks to that beta variable. It's my observation that I've picked up, I wrote down two notes, and I think this is more about the long-term um, development of our software. I think there's opportunity to potentially introduce um, some project management um, add-ons. So the environmental action plan could actually be put into uh, some more intuitive um, software uh, where they can actually build an action plan in our software, which can provide yeah. alerts and notifications saying, have you met, has your green team met? So it's something where we can actually get more uh, more interaction with the software, and then that's something when you're not just seeing the self-assessment checklist, the auditors will be able to also download that that project plan, so you can actually see whether or not they've been utilising it. So I think in the software development meeting that we'll have, probably I think next week, then that's something we can actually start looking at in terms of architecture. I think it's really important, but I think in, that's why we need to be speaking with. Kathy and our lead auditors because they're going to be part of the process. They see the things and they also know when the, when she gets there. She pretty much spoke about them all today. The weaknesses, risk has always been something on the table. Understanding risk and, and the action <laughs> and the whole context of there's there's risk 
there's 101 and there's 10. Okay, and that's Kathy spoke about that. She spoke about the 10, and often the people sit in the whole spectrum here on not really knowing, you know, how, how what their risks are. So there's, I think there's a whole journey there. Um, what else, Jess? Yeah, Anna. Um, just another thing that I think was really great for, um, especially new members to take out of this um, presentation if they listen to this for the first time, is um, that it um, it is actually really um, useful to not wait too long before you have your first audit. So um, something that yeah, Kathy mentioned point. is that um, you know obviously the auditors acknowledge that someone is just at the beginning of their journey. So um, for someone who's new to us, check or in their first year. Um, you know, it is really um, an important step to take to have that first audit. Uh, we all know that, you know, it is a big step to take and it can be a bit daunting and scary, but the value and feedback that you get out of your first audit is so important to then really... Um, this is you know, the sort of check, assessment checklist. Um, ...and the feedback that you get. So um, when I was working as a um, relationship management uh, manager, I got feedback from members who waited, you know, several years um, to have their audit and um, when actually Kathy went to finally conduct their first audit, they said we should have just done this, you know, so much earlier. So, um, yeah, for anyone who's listening, I think that's a great um, thing to take on board. I think it is. I mean, I, I'm just mindful of the pragmatics of not trying to overcook this, but then trying to make it more comprehensive. And I almost thought of two things. So the first thing would be, and they almost have the same thing, so uh, a case study, of what it looks like if you're not prepared for an audit. Because by default, that'll tell you what it looks like if you are prepared. But Because what that means is that, that you, we shared that with people to start with. What it would look like is when you tick yes and don't have an answer to uh, the section, then that's obviously means you haven't thought about it, have you? I, I think that's a point. Or it means they're not sure what to put in there. Yeah, and I think that it, it's much easier then, it's, it softens the fall, if you provided that, and then later on they say, hang in there, but you say, no, we did tell you that's that's what a competent, you know, that comes back to what best practice would look like. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you're really up for the fall. You don't really know, you're going half cooked. They, the green team haven't formed for a while. You've got a new member who's just been there for a short period of time. You've got a very experienced auditor arriving. What's going to happen? <laughs> you're going to have tears. So I'm just trying to sort of, Think about how you pragmatically do that to say this is if you did what an uncooked audit looks like, by default they'll know. And we wouldn't have to be too harsh. It's just the fact that you Kath knows what to look for. As an auditor, you normally know if this hasn't been done well, there's an implication for it. So so I think think about that. I mean, what we good if we can come back to Kathy with, with some of those observations. So look. I think let's finish it, but can I get you to thank Kathy again for being with us today? Uh, you can't explain to people, and I've tried many times to explain what it means to have professional auditors. You know, you, this is a question you guys get all the time. And I was saying to Kathy, it, it's, it's a race to the bottom, not a race to the top in the sustainability industry. The race to the bottom is I've ticked that, the auditor ticked it, and I said I'd done it. That is not an audit. Okay, but that's in fact where the industry is going at the moment. And, and I think our flip side to that is being on, on the front foot.